focus on that. All right. Any other questions? Uh, Representative Robinson. Would you happen to know what the recidivism is for murder? Well, um, I don't have good numbers on youth recidivism for murder, um, and, and some of that would be hard, tricky to figure out because for someone serving life without parole, we wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't calculate recidivism rates like that. Um, it's low, um, but a, an exact figure I can't give you. Now, in terms of the four states that you mentioned, Pennsylvania, uh, and Florida and Louisiana. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, what is the philosophy uh, for, is it just punitive sentencing from those four states? Um, there, it's, it's really um, things like in Michigan. So in Michigan, we include 17-year-olds. We include felony murder. Um, you know, so it's, it's a wider net um, of people who are getting automatically life without parole. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Representative McBroom. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Dr. Thomas. Um, professor. Professor, <laughs> pardon me. Um, thank you very much for your testimony. And I guess, you know, we talk about youth and their inabilities and mental development and all that. I, I'm trying to understand then if that's true and I don't dispute it. Um, why there's some sort of magical line that gets drawn at 18 years old. Because I know some 25-year-olds. <laughs> I have a brother who's 40. That, um, <laughs> and so, <laughs> you know, I, I understand what we're talking about, okay, with, with youth and, the, and just the impetuous nature, the failure to be, you, you know, the whole idea that I'm indestructible and you know, I'm going to win my case, so I'm going to turn down the 15-year second-degree plea deal because, boy, I, the, there's no way the jury's going to convict me. You know, I, I get what we're talking about, but we, then we set this magical line at 18 years old and say, well, it doesn't, it, none of that's existing after you turn 18. So it just seems like we're trying to create some sort of perfect situation here that's but then we, we don't bother to create a perfect situation after that. So I'm having trouble trying to apply it to those who are 16 and 17 as well. I just wonder if you might comment on that. So I guess two things in response to that. Um, the neuroscientists you talk to basically talk about two different things. There's this increase in early youth and sensation seeking. And so you get the sort of like, you know, va va voom, I'm going to go out and jump off buildings, kind of, you know, uh, drive your car fast, you know, that kind of idea. Um, and that, uh, increases early on in early teens. Um, what doesn't unfortunately increase in, in early teens is your executive functioning. So it's the front of your brain where you're really doing all your um, control uh, kinds of activities. And so that uh, takes longer to peak. And that's, you're right, I believe it's in the early 20s. Um, so, you know, the, the 18 is, is on one hand a sort of guesstimate from the science. Um, but you're right that what it really is, is it's the Supreme Court saying we have to draw a line somewhere. Uh, in so many things in society, we've drawn the line at 18 as the age of maturity, and so we're going we're gonna to go with that. Um. Do you believe that there's, you know, these, when some of these crimes are committed, that, uh, that the prosecutors should be keeping them in the juvenile system rather than moving them to the adult system? I'm sure that, um, you know, there are examples of prosecutors that are uh, for 14, 15, and 16-year-olds occasionally either keeping it within the juvenile system or more likely offering those favorable plea deals that, you know, these young people may or may not take. Um, and so I think that, you know, the prosecutors are trying to, uh, you know, distinguish. Uh, unfortunately, once that once they're filed and, and the case goes to court, there's no ability to, to distinguish, uh, even if it's a case where we all might look at it and think that's someone who's much less culpable. The judge doesn't have any discretion at that point? That's correct. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Representative Kesto. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, Professor Thomas. The Supreme Court in Miller v. Alabama could have categorically indicated that this is retroactive. They did not, right? Uh, 
The, the court didn't speak directly to retroactivity, so I guess I might quibble with that they said it's perspective only. Uh, they didn't say. They were silent. Um, they were silent on that question. Um, there are a couple th things. Um, uh, there was a question in regards to Mr. Miller. Uh, there was actually a companion uh, young person, Contrell Jackson, uh, whose case was litigated and decided at the same time as Mr. Miller's case. Uh, unlike Mr. Miller, and this is a little weedy, so I apologize, uh, his case was not on direct appeal. His was one of these sort of collateral Teague cases uh, where his case had already been uh, gone through the system a few times. Um, and the court applied its holding to Mr. Jackson. Um, so to a non-direct appeal, to a Teague case, whatever you want to call it, uh, Mr. Jackson went back to Arkansas and, um, you know, is going to receive the benefit of the decision in the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, so, you know, th they did apply it in a specific case um, to someone on collateral appeal. My question would be, in other cases where the court was silent on retroactivity, what have we seen with those cases? And the reason I ask you, you sound very well versed in uh, case history from the U.S. Supreme Court. So that's my question. So, um, you know, for example, um, the, uh, the other cases I mentioned where there's a categorical ban on a punishment, Roper versus Simmons, uh, there's a previous case uh, banning uh, the death penalty for persons with intellectual debility, w disability, what used to be called mental retardation. Uh, those opinions in the uh, text of the opinion don't specifically speak to the question of retroactivity. Those cases were, however, applied retroactivity. Uh, they were seen to be substantive decisions which changed the punishments that were available. Were they applied retroactively throughout all the states? That's correct. <laughs> Thank you. I had a question. I had a question for you as well. Um, when the attorney general testified earlier this morning, he raised the issue about the the Supreme Court's silence on retroactivity. And in Michigan right now, I've got two federal two lower court federal decisions uh, and a court of appeals decision, and who knows what else might be coming out in the next six months to a year. Wouldn't you agree with the Attorney General's position that we should all wait on the issue of retroactivity until this gets taken up again or possibly clarified by the U.S. Supreme Court? I really think this body should do what it believes to be correct. Um, so this, this body is not bound by um, the Michigan Supreme Court's decision on retroactivity. This body can do what it wants in terms of applying uh, the Miller versus Alabama decision. So even if the Michigan Supreme Court were to decide that Miller isn't retroactive, that doesn't bind what the legislature can do. Well, I, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I thought the AG was talking about the U.S. Supreme Court rendering a decision. Does that change your analysis at all? No, no. Um, obviously, if the U.S. Supreme Court or says it's retroactive, you, you have to do that. Um, but if the court says it's not retroactive, which I wouldn't anticipate, but let's assume they do, um, then the legis state legislatures in each individual state still have autonomy to, uh, to do what they believe is appropriate for their state sentencing system. All right. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? All right. Thank you very much. You. Next, uh, revisiting the dais is our Solicitor General, John Birch. Oh, I'm sorry, and Senator Jones. So I don't have to interrupt the speaker. I would like to put the Senate Judiciary Committee into recess. And uh, senators may stay or leave as they wish. Uh, caucus meeting starts at 11, voting in session at noon. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Chairman Jones, Chairman Heisey, and committee members, uh, my name is John Bursch. I'm the Michigan Solicitor General. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with that position, my job is to supervise all of the appellate litigation on behalf of the state and all of its bodies and agencies and individuals. Uh, in the last two and a half years, I've argued 11 times in the Michigan Supreme Court, five times in the U.S. Supreme Court, and I have a fair amount of familiarity with the Miller v. Alabama issue. Um, I'm going to spend most of my time talking about that, and I do not want to get into the weeds. I want to make this retroactivity idea as simple as you for, uh, for you as possible. Um, as the Attorney General mentioned, generally in this country, U.S. Supreme Court decisions are not applied retroactively in criminal cases. 
If we did do that, then we'd be in the situation where we're continually resentencing people over and over and over again every time the law changes. Uh, that is contrary to the interest that we all have in the finality of judgments, and in particular, respecting state court judgments. Um, so in the Teague case, which you've heard a lot about, uh, the court says that when you've got a collateral case, and again, I'm going to draw that line between someone who's on direct appeal and someone who's on collateral appeal, which means that their appeals have all been exhausted at the time of the change, uh, the court draws this line. If the change is a substantive one, categorically changes the nature of the sentence that can be imposed, uh, then it will be applied retroactively. If it's procedural, it gets applied only prospectively unless it's a watershed event. And so far in the history of the U.S. Supreme Court, they have never found a procedural rule to be watershed. So really the whole game is, is it procedural or substantive? So again, substantive rule changes the scope of the sentence. The procedural rule changes how you get there. So here's a simple example. Um, say you're a parent and you give your child a 10 o'clock bedtime. And then sometime later you change that to a 9 o'clock bedtime. That's a substantive change. If instead the change in policy that you make is that they can go to bed at 10 o'clock, but they have to ask you for permission first, and you have to say yes, then that's a procedural change. And, and you can see how this is applied in uh, a case that the U.S. Supreme Court decided a little while ago called Apprendi. And Apprendi involved federal judges who sentence criminal defendants and give them longer sentences because of certain factors. They were carrying a gun. They acted in a particularly egregious manner, things like that. And traditionally, those judges had always found those facts, whether they had a gun, et cetera, and used those to apply the sentence. So in Apprendi, the U.S. Supreme Court says, uh, no, under our Constitution, only a jury can decide those extra factors, like whether they had a gun. And that's our new rule of law. Well, since then, the federal courts of appeals have looked at that issue, and they have unanimously concluded that that was a procedural change that doesn't apply retroactively, even though it could mean a different sentence if you had gotten the benefit of the procedure. That's because your eligibility for a sentence is exactly the same before and after Apprendi. All that changed is you now get a hearing in front of a different person. So Miller v. Alabama is exactly the same way. And, and there are two aspects of Miller v. Alabama. They've been touched on, but I want to make this crystal clear for the committee. The primary argument in Miller v. Alabama is that life without parole sentences for teenage murderers were on their face unconstitutional in all circumstances. And 9-0, the U.S. Supreme Court unanimously did not adopt that argument. If there had been that categorical change in the kind of sentence you could have, and, and you heard Professor uh, Thomas talk about um, other contexts where juveniles are no longer eligible for the death penalty, that's where the subject matter, the, the, the categorical sentence does change. If that had been the case, then this would be easy. It's retroactive. But that's not what they said. Instead, they said only that these cannot be imposed mandatorily, and so there's a process change. We're going to require you to go to a hearing in front of the judge first before that final decision is made. And if there's any doubt about this, um, it's right in the Miller opinion. And I'm going to read two sentences of the opinion for you, keeping in mind the difference between a categorical change in the nature of a sentence on the one hand, retroactive, and a process change, not retroactive. The Supreme Court says, quote, our decision does not categorically bar a penalty for a class of offenders or types of crime, as for example we did in Roper or Graham. Those are the decisions that Professor Thomas referenced. Instead, it mandates only that a sentence follow a certain process considering an offender's youth and attendant characteristics before imposing a particular penalty. So the Supreme Court wasn't really silent about this issue at all. You know, if you want to read the cards, they gave us the formula for deciding what they're going to do on retroactivity. And so the Michigan Court of Appeals, in that 66-page opinion, um, you held unanimously based on this language and other factors, that it should not be applied retroactively. Um, one little weed that I'll get into that Professor uh, Thomas mentioned, there was a companion case to Miller v. Alabama, Jackson v. Hobbs, and that was on collateral review. However, the issue of retroactivity was never raised in Jackson v. Hobbs, and it's well established in the U.S. Supreme Court that when you do not raise an issue regarding retroactivity, the fact that the court applies a change in law to that person doesn't say anything about what the court thinks about retroactivity. And the Michigan Court of Appeals agreed with that argument as well.
So you've got the Michigan Court of Appeals decision. It's the exact same result that the Florida Court of Appeals reached when presented with the exact same question. It's the exact same result that two federal courts of appeals have also reached involving that same question.